aloha, and welcome to Thumbing Through Yesterday, the podcast where we take our favorite books off the shelf, dust them off, and remind ourselves why it is we love them so. My name's Tom Galley, and joining me today, we've got Tony Pasculi. Happy to be here, as always. And today, we're talking about one of Tony's favorites, another visit to Heinlein's Worlds. Yep. Uh, although not a typical Heinlein. This is Glory Road, Glory which Road. is a fantasy. He's uh, normally a science fiction writer. I think this is his only fantasy. I can't think of another one. Uh, and, and at that, it's not even a proper fantasy. It is a deconstruction of epic fantasy. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So fun, fun book. Uh, yeah. And the standard question, why is this <laughs> a favorite for you? You know, I've been thinking about that because it's funny. Every time we read a book for this podcast, I, I read it with sort of, you know, I don't read it as a favorite reader coming back to it. I look at it with a much more critical eye because I know I'm going to be talking about it with you. Uh, and this is going out on the air, and and I look at these books, and some of them are kind of like I I cringe a little bit <laughs> as I reread some of these. It's like ah, uh, was was this a cringer? You know, in places, yes, but but I will make no apologies. Still a favorite. I love yeah. it. I love well, this book. I, I suspect that this is going to strongly parallel <laughs> our discussion for Under the Green Star by Lynn Asprin, just with a reversal of roles here. Oh, possibly. Uh, yeah, I I would hold it up. I would, okay, well, I won't say that. Uh, yeah, for, for me, this book holds up. I think, it, I think it is, I think it has some challenges for a modern reader. Um, but let's, that's down the road. Yep. Let's answer your specific question first. Why is this a favorite? It is a favorite pretty much for one reason. Uh, the personal ad. <laughs> the personal ad okay. is the greatest call to adventure of any fantasy I've ever read. And this guy, our hero, Oscar... His name's not even Oscar, but Oscar Gordon. Uh, he gets out of the military and he's trying to figure out what to do with his life. Uh, and he takes a little bit of a detour in the south of France and he's just sort of enjoying some time before he rotates back to the States. And he meets a beautiful woman, but he neglects to get her name and he's, he's desperate to find her again. And then he sees this personal ad in the newspaper, mm -hmm. which looks like it's written for him. And I won't read the whole thing because it's kind of long, but it starts, are you a coward? And then it details what they're looking for. Uh, and then says, um, da, 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 permanent employment, very high pay, glorious adventure, great danger. You must apply in person. This is almost like the pitch that Gaia gave to Sirocco, right? When she yes. offered her the job as wizard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, it, and it's exactly the same pitch. It's like, be my, be my hero. Yeah. Be my literal hero. Uh, and... And it's fun because the, the book starts with this great call to adventure and then it really hits the hero's journey beats pretty hard all the way through. But then it really screws with them also all the way through. So, yeah. yeah. So that's why it's a favorite. I yeah. got pretty far into this book and had almost convinced myself that I was wrong. I had never read it before because it, it just <laughs> nothing seemed familiar. Um, I really loved the protagonist. I loved the way he was milking the, the military retirement system and dodging yep. it to, you know, <laughs> to get himself to where he could actually take advantage of the, the, the few loopholes that had afforded him some luxury. Um, right up until the moment that they reached the Doral's house. The Doral is one of those passages, not even a passage, yep. it's a whole detour in the book. It's but about 20% it, of the book, I think. You know, I, I got into that and it's like, he's going to refuse to sleep with somebody and they're going to end up leaving with a cold breakfast and it's going to set off this whole misunderstanding thing. It's like, yes, I have read this before. And then it's yes. like, yep, sure enough, the, the, the women come in, he doesn't sleep with them. And then, yep, there's a cold shoulder of mutton sitting yep. in a congealed pool of grease. I'm like, yep, I have read this before. But that was, that's, there were like two things about the entire book that I remembered, and that was one of them. Well, here, here's the thing with Heinlein, and you have to know what you're getting in for when you read Heinlein, is that this is, if there's one overarching theme to his work, it is that there are no moral absolutes. There are parochial traditions. So, and he, he spends loves a couple to, of lengthy chapters lecturing <laughs> us on that in this and one. And it's the lecturing that's the problem. I don't mind that as a theme, but oh God, does it feel like a lecture after I've read for the, sort of the fifth or sixth time? Yep. And it, and it really takes you out of the fantasy. the The part before that is great. The yep. feast. I mean, he's really he's at the beginning of his career as a hero. He's uh, he's fought the horn ghosts. And he's defeated Igly, and that's it. And he's just like stepped foot on Glory Road. And then they get to celebrate him as a hero. They have this big feast. He recites epic poetry in English, which they don't speak, so he gets away with Casey at the bat, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot of fun. It's really fun. And then he makes this faux pas of rejecting the offer of bed. Uh, 
and then it just becomes very, very luxury. It's just, yeah. oh. <laughs> and, you know, it, it does this three or four times in the book. Yes. Um, you know, Heinlein's got to to beat us over the head with this this concept that he's got. Yeah. Um, and it a couple of times it is literally lecturing. It's literally Star setting Oscar down and telling him what's going on, or Rufo yes. setting Oscar down and telling him what's what. Yeah. Um, yeah. So on the one hand... I would say this was kind of a new idea when Heinlein was writing this. I mean, I don't know if it was new, but it wasn't... Uh, uh, he wrote this in 1963, I want to say. He wrote this right after Stranger in a Strange Land. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, on the one hand, a weird departure from Stranger, but on the other hand, thematically, it's the same book. Uh, I mean, it's that same idea. Stranger in a Strange Land is this guy comes from Mars and he's like, hey, everything you're doing here, you're doing because of thousands of years of tradition and not because it's good. Let me start a new tradition that is better. Yep. Um, so that's kind of what's going on here. But at the same time, it's, if you're past this, if this is not something that you need to learn for your own life, it's pretty tedious. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to, to wrap my head around the fact that there was a point in time when this might have actually been novel. Right, that, that seeing something like this popularized by a mainstream, as mainstream as a science fiction writer ever can be, um, author, you know, might have taken people's breaths away. Oh my goodness, the scandal! You know, did you hear what he said? You know, but, you say yeah. that, and yet, when was gay marriage legalized in this country? Recently, recently, yeah, and, and not not <laughs> unilaterally, right? There are yes. places this is still an issue. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that that's still boggles my mind. And it's the same thing. It's like, okay, now we're going to talk about incest. Trigger warning. Uh, <laughs> and there's no incest in this book. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, there's no incest in this book. It's hard to keep track with Highland because it's a, <laughs> another running theme. But it, it's a very similar idea. And people just freak out at Highland going, oh my God, what is this thing with incest he has? And what it is, I think, uh, it's, the, it's the last taboo. Uh, it's the last, you cannot sleep with this person because you're related to them. And he spends an entire book, Time Enough for Love, the entire book is about picking apart that idea. Uh, when is incest okay and when is it not okay? And there's a couple of reasons for the taboo and the main taboo is genetic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other taboo, which he doesn't really address, is you know if you grow up with people who are uh, younger than you or in your ho same household, then there's a weird power balance, power dynamic that's, that's kind of creepy and gross. Uh, so he doesn't talk about that part, but he does pick apart the genetic thing. Um, and he, and I think he does this as an example of an ultimate taboo so that people can take this and bring it, port it back to an easier taboo like trans identity or gay marriage or something like that. Or, uh, Oh my God, mixed race marriage even. Mm -hmm. Remember when the Jeffersons was on the air? That wasn't I that do. long ago either. Yeah. That was like groundbreaking television. When Kirk kissed Uhura <laughs> on yeah. Star Trek. I mean, yeah. So 1963 predates the Jeffersons and predates Star Trek. So, yeah. yeah. So he's, you, you think what he's doing is he's picking the most indefensible taboos, throwing it in people's faces to make them more agreeable to reconsidering some less defensible or less indefensible. I, I don't some, think some less vile <laughs> taboos. I don't think he's as much trying to like move the Overton window so much as he is. Uh, he's trying to get people to say he's trying to get people to reason about a taboo in a particular mm -hmm. way. Yeah. So here, it, the taboo, in fact, is not incest. It's it's sleeping with someone uh, who he's not sure he's supposed to sleep with. Right, just sex in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then it, that turns out to be a, a mistake, and so so we get that whole explanation. And again, if you're past that, it's a boring explanation. But if you're not, it's not. I suppose it's hard to think, you know, can I rewind my mental clock? What was what was this like to me the first time I read it? I honestly don't remember. Yeah. You know, I remember the fact that I've read it, but, you know, very little of it stuck with me. You know, the incident with um, um, that particular incident yeah. with the Doral at his home stuck with me. And then there was something later in the book that was equally, you know, it wasn't part of the arc, but it was just a scene, a vignette that for whatever reason I read it, it's like, oh, I know how this turns out, you know. Hmm. Was it on center where there's I feel the, like it was on center. The furry girl who wants to touch his sword? That was one no, of the No, that wasn't. Okay. I don't think that was it. <laughs> now, center, since we brought it up, one of the yeah. things that I thought was interesting about center was, you know, when he gave us, and we just get like two or three examples of it, but the yeah. the ultra condensed language yeah. that they speak there. Um, and I was thinking, this is Newspeak. This is, this is George Orwell's 1984. Um, it's actually, it's got another precedent in Heinlein's own work. 
uh, he wrote a book called, I believe it's called Golf, where there are people who have learned to use more than 10% of their brain. Uh, and, and the first thing they do is they invent a new language, which is much more dense. And so they can, they can communicate with each other 10 times as fast. Uh, mm. and there's a guy who gets brought into this community and has to learn this new language. Yeah. 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 Newspeak had a different agenda. Well, uh, yeah, well okay. In a way, it's the opposite of Newspeak, right? Because yeah. the, the function of Newspeak was to limit the idea to express abstract ideas. You could only express ideas that were in line with party exactly. doctrine. Yeah. Um, but the, the idea that it was condensed and it was a shrinking language, um, uh, I could see a little parallel there, although we don't know that yeah. you know, the one was a shrinking language, but it was certainly ultra condensed. Um, and it would be full of inference. I'm not sure that it would be a better idea, but it gave him something fun to play with. I th yeah, I don't know that the particular condensation of the speech in center is very good because it. I don't know that reducing your vocabulary uh, makes it easier to communicate. It makes it easier to learn a language for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but then if you need to talk about something that's not covered by one of your hundred nouns, you have to start yep. jamming nouns together like they do in Germany. And then you end up with these <laughs> Sprechen Haltestelle, the speaking talking place. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think I will start walking up to people and saying <laughs> self. Just self. To see how many people <laughs> react to it. Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, so speaking of center also, another thing that makes this book kind of unique uh, in the fantasy world is that... Uh, so you have the, so it actually begins way before the call to adventure. We have the whole bit about uh, him being in the military. Actually, mm -hmm. him, we start with him in high school. Yep. It's really not necessary. Um, but it's important for him thematically for reasons that turn out to be a misfire. But we start with our hero in high school and he joins the military and he's got a poor upbringing. He doesn't know how he's going to pay for college. He doesn't know how he's going to get a good job. Da -da 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 -da. All through his military career and some side adventures there. And then we get to this. We're at page 42 of 320 pages. That's pretty deep in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And then we go through our hero's adventure or our, our hero's journey, and then we keep going. And we keep going for quite a <laughs> while after that, yeah. I would say a third of the book is after the happy ending. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I remember, you know, as, as, <laughs> as there... Oh, that's that's what I remembered was the uh, was going through the hallway to get the egg. Right, mm. he's doing these shenanigans. He's going around a corner that isn't there and yeah. crawling through a tunnel that isn't there. I remembered that little bit. That's the only other thing that had stuck with me. But you're right. I mean, we're we're there, right? He he. They've reclaimed the egg, yeah. and you know, I'm looking at the bottom of the the Kindle, and it's like 78 percent done. I'm like, <laughs> what's left? <laughs> what's left with this thing? So much is left. Yep. So much thematic nonsense is left. The story's over, but now we just got to go. Oh. Yeah. Now's. Then we get the next two big chapters on lecturing about uh, yes. lack of absolutes. Then it gets very, very preachy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's awfully slow on the uptake about what's an obvious solution to his, you know, I don't want to throw air quotes around the word problem. Yeah. Right. Oh, my God, I've got all the money, more money than I can conceive of. Uh, they've been sneakily uh, dosing me with good health, so I'm going yeah. to live a long time. I'm insanely wealthy. I can be as educated as I want to. Oh, woe is me. It's like, how, how obvious is, well, Just I don't know. Leave, go, go on an adventure. Yeah, go yeah. do it for a while. You know, yeah. but I mean, all right. So he's 25, 26 at this point, yeah. you know, and literally the only relationship he's had, or maybe she's, just, maybe Star is a second. I don't, I think he kind of alludes to. I think he got Dear John important. when he was in the yeah, military. Yeah, he got Dear yeah. John in the military, right? Yeah. But he, which he got over in a surprisingly adult fashion for again <laughs> yeah. a twenty-something who was jilted by a Dear John letter. But yeah. uh, well, he's a he's an ultimate pragmatist, this hero. Yeah, well, very Heinlein in yeah. that. Yeah. And the other thing, uh, you know, and and I had to just you know roll my eyes and roll with it. Um, <laughs> you know, the Heinlein thing of if these two characters are supposed to be together, they are all in from the moment they meet. Yes. Right. It's like. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my lady. Oh, my darling. Oh, my princess. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> just, just roll my eyes and take it. This, this is the way, right? He yep. doesn't want to establish, he doesn't want to spend time establishing these foundations of the relationship. They're just, they're just in. All right. So I, that is very much a Highland trope, but I want to say that it's a little bit more defensible in this book. Uh, and they talk about that later on. Um, she is the perfect woman for him and he is the perfect man for her because she has been looking for him for 
dozens of years. She's combed through billions of candidates mm -hmm. to pick her perfect guy. Yep. So it's shouldn't it's not that much of a stretch that if you spend that much time on that many candidates, you find someone who's a really good fit. Yeah. Uh, and then she, in a, likewise, is tailored to him. She pre, in her presentation and everything because she's putting on a persona. Yep. She's a role. She is hide. She has hidden who her true self is from him. By the time they get married, uh, he doesn't find out until after the quest is over exactly what he's gotten himself into. Yeah, and she okay. She did some pretty underhanded <laughs> manipulation there. I mean, it it being a, a happy novel, it turns out yeah. well. But I mean, you know, Rufo was a little bit unhappy with how she handled things, and I think justifiably yeah. so. And I think Oscar did not react nearly as negatively as could have. Um, as, but, you know, yeah. But, but you, get, you say he's the <laughs> ultimate pragmatist. Maybe yeah. that's entering into it. He's like, well, okay, this is the fact. The person I married is the empress of 20 universes, <laughs> um, and she's been secretly dosing me with long life. Yeah. What am I okay at this moment I can it, I can decide what to do. It's know? hard to complain about that without feeling petty. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, whoops, yeah. Oops, my my hot girlfriend is the most powerful being in the universe and I'm gonna be immortal. That's unfair. Yep, that yeah. really is unfair. <laughs> Yeah, and then it turns out it is unfair, but again, Star defends herself, I think, very accurately by saying, you didn't have to marry me, and I tried to dissuade you from doing it. You could have, you know, we could have rolled in the hay all you want, you know, you could have collected your hero's pay all day, every day, without getting married. Yep. Uh, but he insisted, so. He did, but, you know, 26, headstrong, versus, I don't know that we actually get a number on her, but a few hundred. Hundreds, at least hundreds, hundreds yeah. With... Four distinct additional personalities, wise personalities of previous leaders already at her disposal. Yeah. That's uh, not a fair. You're, <laughs> you're taking advantage of the poor kid. I don't know. At some point, you got to say, you're 26, you're an adult, you can make your own decisions, ask some questions, kick the tires. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So... Although she doesn't, she she pretends she protests. I'll answer anything you ask me, and then ref goes on to not answer anything. anything he asks her. You know, <laughs> you know. We get several That's times. Fair. Oh, darling, I'll tell you everything once we have dot 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 as yeah. soon as dot dot dot. You know, yeah. but those explanations never come until they have the egg, and then it's like yeah. surprise. Yeah. So in spite of that, in spite of all of that, in spite of the fact that it's not really a fantasy, it's a deconstruction of a fantasy, despite the fact that it, that it takes its own sweet time getting started and then extends its welcome well beyond, or extends its stay well beyond its, uh, its welcome at the end of the denouement, uh, I love this book. I love the fantasy. It's just fun for me. I love the battle with the horned ghosts. I love the defeat of Igli. I love sneaking through the dragon forest and that line where they, they get all the way to the end and they have to kill a baby dragon. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, oh, it's a hell of a thing when you can't feel good about killing a dragon. Uh, that's just, ah, yep. oh, that's great. There yeah. were good, several good <laughs> one-liners in there. Yeah, but I, I fully understand anyone who comes to this book and just goes, ugh. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, now the, the long burn, the slow burn getting into it didn't bother me at all. Yeah. Um, if I could go through with the scissors and take out, I'm going to dare say, 100 pages of preaching, mm -hmm. um, I think that this would be a, a much better read. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although, you know, it's interesting. If you start talking about cutting this book, you could do that. You could make it a more traditional fantasy book, but it would not be the book Heinlein wrote. It would not be the book he set out to write. You would have to turn it into something else to, by doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, keeping the story but losing the... the um, the agenda. Yeah. Right. Oh, this is, I do love the fact that this doesn't end where you expect a fantasy to end. Yeah. So, any, so that's a good explanation for why this has never been made into a movie and probably never will be uh, because nobody wants to see this on screen. It's just, it's just defies too many expectations. How would you market this? Well, whatever made it to the screen would have little in common. It, it would be Starship <laughs> Troopers, right? It would have little uh, in common yes. with, with the source material. Yeah. Has there, there hasn't been any decent Heinlein on screen, has there? I don't know. I mean, that's something we'd have to go and look up because he's got such a breadth of work. I'd be stunned if somebody hasn't tried, you know, and if there aren't some low budget or B movies or, or things hiding out there. Predestination. Predestination is a 
feature length adaptation of All You Zombies, which is a short story, time travel story, uh, with Ethan Hawke. And it is, it is not bad, but it loses something in being blown up to feature length, I think. Yeah. Part of the fun of that story is that it's so condensed and so twisted. It's like a, it's like a pretzel. Yeah. But yeah, were they to make this, were they to take this to the big screen, it'd be what we're talking about. We, we would lose all of the um, taboo challenging and we would lose all of the there is no morality, um, yeah. you know, and it would just be the story of the, the man, the girl, and the dwarf fighting the dragons. Yeah, well, maybe we'll, you know, maybe 20 years from now, uh, someone will be, you know, when, we've, when Marvel has had its run and we're like, okay, we're ready for something else now. Yeah, when there are no more taboos left in society, then people will trot this out as a historical piece. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it seems unlikely. It does. Yeah. Uh, another, actually, another historical sort of taboo, uh, which is a big debate right now, which Heinlein addresses right here, is polyamory. Um, and that's a thing that, you know, people, a lot of people learned about polyamory for the first time during the um, uh, the Sam Bankman Freed, what was his uh, thing called, that whole crisis? Um, I'm blanking. Uh, the the crypto exchange crash, just absolute f uh, FTX, FTX and Alameda trading. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what FTX stands for. And then one of the facts that kept coming up in stories was that uh, Sam Bankman Fried and his, his partner running Alameda uh, were in a polycule. Uh, which means that they they were in a mutually polyamorous relationship with a couple of other people, um, and, and it was just like buzz, 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 buzz. What this, <laughs> this is crazy? What kind of weirdos are these people? No wonder they got into a horrible financial disaster. Uh, I, I don't know that the one has anything to do with the other, but yeah, it, it gives us it gives something to to whisper about. Yeah. It absolutely does not. It absolutely does not. But I'm just saying it really thrust polyamory into the spotlight for the first time for a lot of people. And a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> so, and, and this is something that Heinlein again has been talking about this since 1963. That's one of the great things about science fiction uh, is that you can try out different ideas about society. This is something that Star Trek did really well. You just like, you look at some aspect of society and say, well, what if there was a society that did it differently? What would that be like? And you can sort of look at the pros and cons and how it plays out. Uh, and I think Star Trek shares some... Uh, qualities with Heinlein and, and delivering it with a side of preachiness. But, uh, but yeah, that's one of the great things about uh, science fiction is that exploration of alternate societies, not just the technology. Yeah. So and Heinlein does that very well. Moon is a Harsh Mystery, we talked about that quite a bit. Yeah. So, and, and I'm sure it'll return on whatever our next Heinlein is. Yeah. So, yeah. So readers out there, maybe don't start with this one. If you're not <laughs> familiar with Heinlein, save this one for later. But... Uh, but yeah, I still love it. I enjoy the heck out of it. I will probably read it several more times before I die because it's good. that much fun. That's, that's the nature <laughs> of the favorites, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? I mean, I, go, I have all kinds of like notes on here, but there's nothing really No, juicy. I mean, I, this, this for me was kind of a, uh, I, I never really got into it, yeah. um, you know. So this, this is one that if, if this is the last time I read it before I die, I'm probably okay with that. If it comes back up, I won't pass it off, you know, I won't pass on it, but I don't think I'll seek it out. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Uh, well, what are we reading next? Next, we're going back again to uh, early days for me, a little bit of Patrick McManus with a fine and pleasant misery. All right. Looking forward to that. See you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs>